Yo, how you doing there, family? This is your brother, Vimeer Dees. Peace to you, peace to your home, peace to your family, peace to your community, peace to your ancestry, peace to my community, peace to my ancestry, and peace to the nation that you, I, and they are creating. Peace also to the Godic forces, to the great spirit above, to the mother earth below. May we all come together at this moment in time and prepare the way forward for our journeys. I don't know if I'll always use that, but I like it. <clears throat> I also asked if uh, we all could come together now and prepare for our, the defense of our lives because we are going to need it. I have heard, um, I, I follow many YouTube channels and most of those channels, you know, if I'm to be honest, deal in the realm of um, person to person relationships. All of them, just about all of them, claim to deal with racism, white supremacy in some way. And many of them do, in fact, deal with racism, white supremacy. However, there is one area that most of them are lacking. And that, um, allow me first to say this before I talk about that area. Uh, we have been stuck for some time, I think, as uh, black people. We are not yet a community, but we are a people. And we have been stuck <clears throat> in this notion that if we deal with culture, then all of our problems will, will be solved. Well, the reality is our culture has been hijacked and we have done very little to prevent it from being hijacked. Um, I was thinking some time ago how odd it is presently that we as black folks have never made more music and yet we as black folks have never made less relevant music in our lives. We are starving for true authorship in the realm of music. And I never thought that I'd have to say that. More, what also struck me as odd is most of the music that we make is one on one. One person makes the instrumental, another person lays down all of the words. And yet we live in an age where instruments have never been this cheap. If in the 1970s, black people could have purchased intru uh, instruments at the price that they can purchase instruments today, you would have had a thousand earth, wind and fires making music of that caliber. Because the strength of our souls was so prevalent and present in everything that we did that if you gave these type of sources, not resources, but sources of inspiration and creativity to those people, we would have had music the likes of which we, we'd we still not have enough time to enjoy that much, much music. We have been placed into a coma. <clears throat> we have been placed into a horrifying coma. And we don't even know that we're in it. We're walking around dead. That is how bad we uh, of a situation we are in presently. And it's not because we have chose to per se. There is choice somewhat. Uh, it is because we have been manipulated into that position. I believe it was uh, Minister Farrakhan years ago who said, uh, white people are in the business of mind control. And that is the truth. They have studied you as a black man, woman, or child. 
more than you even know and could ever know. And what they have done with that information is to control you. We cannot just look at culture, though. The area, and, and culture has meant many different things for black people. This has, that has covered history. This has covered um, our music, our dress, our hairstyle, the way we walk, the way we talk. It has been very well uh, design, uh, defined. But the one area that we tend to run from and we tend to move away from very rapidly is an area that presents us with the greatest challenge presently, and that is uh, the area of politics. Now, give me a moment, and I'm going to continue this in one second. I'm here today because the ancestors told me that I need to talk to you about some of this stuff that's been going on that we are not talking about. Racism, white supremacy is imploding. It is imploding. The contradictions, the psychological contradictions in every institution created by uh, Europeans <clears throat> excuse me, is being exposed. And those contra contradictions, not only in the institutions, but in the people also, are causing violent shockwaves to run through everything that was created over these past 600 years. And those shockwaves are testing the limits of everything and destroying much of it. What is so important about this for black people particularly is the United States of America is in real danger of ceasing to be what it has been. Stable. Nothing more than that. Stable. There's a truth that many people don't want to admit. So many uh, commentators that I listen to talk about the American empire, but very few of them want to admit the fact of why the Americas, uh, the Americans have their empire. Their empire is to extract wealth from other places and bring it here. The reason why we can buy things so cheaply is because the long stick of the American government goes across the oceans and beats other people into submission and forces them to give us the sources, not resources, for the things that are built cheaply and then sold here. That's why. The world, however, because of what has occurred since 2016, understand family. <clears throat> Europeans in this country erred and they are continuing to error. In fact, I was just reading an article by Chris Hedges, and he reminded me of how bad this error was. But they erred. Western civilization, which includes Europe, has banked on the stability of the Anglo world. They have banked on it uh, by relying on the United States to remain stable. When Donald Trump talks about NATO, when he talks about the European states not paying their fair share, what he is essentially telling you, not really essentially, he is telling you, is that the United States military maintains the global uh, hegemony the global control system for all of Europe and the Anglo world. That includes Canada. That includes uh, Australia. That includes any place where white people are trying to hold power, even though they are not the majority. The United States controls the world so that the Anglo portion of the world 
the European portion of the world can can thrive. Now, it's important that we understand thriving and flourishing are two different things. Most of your people who are under the hegemonic, the control of the European world order would love it if the world flourished. That is companionship, cooperativeness. That is the idea of camaraderie, of working together to build something great. Whereas the Anglo world, and now even partly the Asian world, wants the world, wants themselves to thrive. Thriving is what bacteria does when it's not supposed to be in a specific area. It thrives. Why? Because it lives off of what something else provides. To say something thrives is to say that it is parasitic. To say something thrives is to say that it is parasitic. And I'm not being hyperbolic. I'm not being uh, extreme when I say this. I'm literally telling you, you look at the definition and you compare it to a parasite, and that is exactly what you get. That's why in this in this economic order, they always talk about things thriving. The world, because of what was done in 2016, the world is, is realizing that the United States is unstable. That the psychological contradictions in this country have led the United States to a brink of uh, to the brink of of shattering. The psychological health of this country is fragmented dramatically in the United States, which has always been a schizophrenic country, but it was a tolerable uh, schizophrenic state. The United States, which has always been schizophrenic to some degree, is now having a full-blown psychiatric or, or psychosic, uh, uh, there's a word that I can't remember right now, but um, they're having a full psychotic episode where they have completely broken from reality. And particularly, the elite have broken from reality and are now in a process of twirling to the point where they're starting to destroy each other. The stability, the stability of the United States, the States is now threatened. The world is seeing this. I read an article back in 2017, shortly after Trump assumed office. Uh, it was in the German magazine uh, Der Spiegel, <clears throat> which has a German edition and an English edition. And in the German edition, the the individual writing it suggested that it is time for Germany to rise and to basically assume mantle of control over Europe. In other words, and if you trace, which I know most of us aren't, because again, too many black people who are talking about culture have their eyes on the wrong thing. You want to talk about a black agenda? Anyway, um, the essentially what Germany is doing, if you trace what they've been doing since that occurred, since that was written, they have been uh, gathering, uh, consolidating their power in Europe to be able to possibly execute a takeover of the of the EU. I don't know if that's going to happen. I'm not predicting it's going to happen. But Germany is by far the strongest economy in Europe, or so I hear. What essentially though was being said and what has been continuously communicated, especially if you look into the number of, of uh, countries that are dropping the United States dollar in oil, uh, uh, transfers. So when they buy, when usually when a country buys oil, they pay in dollars. Many countries are dropping that, including Iran. There's been hints that Russia is going to be doing it. There's been hints that China is going to be doing it. There's been hints that um, 
Saudi Arabia, uh, not Saudi Arabia, uh, there was another one, I think it's Turkey. And now even the EU is starting to examine whether or not they'll use U.S. dollars for um, uh, buying uh, oil. What does this mean? What does this mean? For black people, this means something very, very specific. One second. It means that this country is going to continue to, in some form or another, continue to get unstable. Now, <clears throat> it is not likely that the country is going to, you know, in two days or a month or three months or five months, fall apart. But considering where this is likely heading, the United States may not end up being a um, being the country uh, with the most money in in other countries' reserves. Right now, the U.S. dollar is the international reserve uh, currency. So countries keep the United States reserve, uh, excuse me, United States dollars as the reserve currency, which helps keep the the dollar stable. However that may be on the outs. So then the only thing that will help the United States government is the level of debt that's out there as long as people want to hold it. And as long as it's profitable to hold it, countries will hold it. Black people cannot wait to see if that's going to turn out right. We need to start planning for the time when things are going to get rough. We're looking to the government to have a black agenda. We need to understand, man, the United States government is being held hostage by corporations and international uh, res resolutions and treaties and stuff that we really have no clue about. We as black people need to stop playing and we need to start preparing for the day when we may not be able to count on the United States government giving us the kind of protection that we need. Now, the ancestors tell me, understand, because we've been all, we've been reading sort of the history of the Black Panthers a little bit wrong. The Black Panthers was stopped, not because they were necessarily revolutionary. It was because they were self-actual, uh, yeah, self-actualizing people. They promoted and preached something that is very, very common and dear and near to African life. Not independence, but interdependence. In Africa, to be one is to be many. To be many is to be one. They preached what our souls knew. And that was that we could do what we wanted to do for the, for the betterment of, or excuse me, we could do what we needed to do for the betterment of the community. Moreover, at a time when the white uh, economic establishment was pushing to have black economic stability, and there were communities, and we were not told about this history, and this is massively important. There were black communities throughout this country in the 1930s, the 1940s, and 1950s, that were stable economic basins for black economics. Part of the post-World War II order was to destroy those communities, particularly the business districts, so that then that would force black people into buying white goods. Why? That means our money, which had stayed in our communities, would have to then fly to white communities. That would help white people, not us. And indeed, it is this spirit of being able to grow and develop our own um, institutions that the Black Panthers were really preaching. And that was dangerous because we had demonstrated at least three times since uh, we were supposedly emancipated, that we could build, rebuild, and re-rebuild what was destroyed. By the end of Reconstruction, we had dozens of flourishing, well-working communities set up throughout the South and the North. 
Very, just like that. Boom. We did it. I'm not saying we didn't have some help from outside people, but it was amazing how far we went very quickly. And then even though many of those things were destroyed in the you know decade or so after Reconstruction, we then rebuilt them again. So that then by the time, I think it was 1919 when Red Summer occurred, which if you don't know what Red Summer is, man, Google that. Red Summer. It occurred the same year. It had to be 1919 because it occurred the same year. And I, I didn't know this, by the way. I had to look this up. It occurred the same year that women, white women, got the right to vote. Don't get it twisted. White women got the right to vote, not black women. All this camaraderie nonsense of feminism today is absolutely that. It's nonsense. White women got the right to vote. Anyway, they destroyed dozens of black communities, burned them down, killed they say something like a couple thousand people, please. It was probably more like 30 or 40 or 50,000 people. They destroyed us uh, institutionally. And yet we built it back up. So that then by the time World War II ended, we again had dozens of well-working communities. And then they went to war with us and destroyed our basins again. And what we have essentially been living under is their authority because they haven't allowed us to build communities that were outside of their jurisprudence. That must end. That must end. Because they can't even provide protection for their own people economically. We must now show the way. So now, instead of spending our time looking at celebrities and and becoming goo goo gaga about celebrities and what's going on with them. You know, it has its place. It can be fun sometimes, but it's time to get serious. It's time to really get serious. For those of you who play sports, let me tell you about being serious. There is a psychology, uh, um, a discipline of psychology that is associated with sports. And you can actually take that discipline and apply it to real world stuff. In other words, you can discover why it is that you're so good with sports because it's not just about playing sports. It's mental. It's constructive. You can do things in the real world with what you are doing in sports. That type of mentality, that toughness, of mind to go into sports and, and into the sports arena and compete. That talks about a toughness of soul that is, man, it's needed to build our community. But most of you don't know about that. Sports psychology, look it up. Sports psychology, look it up. You have children, you have nieces, nephews who play sports, young Get them young. Get them into sports psychology now. Get them into the idea of melding the mind and the body and what you can actually accomplish with that. Because we are powerful when we do that. And we must do it. Not because we hate white people. Not because we want to show off white people. Not because of white people. We need to do it. Well, actually, I, I just said not because of white people. But we actually do need to do it because... Things could get unstable, and if they get unstable, we can't count on all white people to protect us. We need to have our own communities. I'm not saying that white people shouldn't be allowed in them. I'm not saying that non-black people shouldn't be allowed in them. I'm saying that we need to have the the worth, the self-worth, to define those communities, define what's going to go on in those communities, build them up, because we are capable of doing that, and look to the future. Know that we will provide the stability for this country and countries abroad. We don't th we don't realize as black people that so many people have their eyes on us. They have their eyes on us. They are looking at us. What we do matters. Matters. It changes the world. We need to now with our young people. It's not just about educating them. Mm -mm. Black young young men and women want to do things that are going to have immediate impacts. And yet we're always telling them to wait till tomorrow, wait till tomorrow, wait till tomorrow, wait till tomorrow. To hell with that. 
I know many successful white parents. You know what they tell their kids? When they say they want to do something significant now, they say, do it. Do it. Let me help you do it, but do it. To hell with, stop raising your kids to want to work for people. And, excuse me, not stop raising them to want to work for people. Stop raising them to work, uh, to want to work for the wrong people. And I take that one from Boyce Watkins. Stop raising your children to to want to work for the wrong people. Let them work for their for their people. You know, I seen a young man. And I uh, give me one second. Give me one second. So uh, I'm back. A couple of years ago, I saw a young man um, walking on the street, probably about eight or nine years old. And you know, you you. You, you've seen brothers like this. And he was a young brother. And, uh, you know, he he was looking kind of around, but had his head down. And I said, hey, how's it going there, young blo uh, young brother? And he looked up at me and he goes, hi, how you doing? And I'm like, hey, how's it going? I go, how's school going? He goes, ah, oh, well, you know. And I go, well, okay. How's it going? He goes, it's kind of going okay. It's fine. I go, well, what's your favorite subject? And he first says gym. And I go, of course, gym's fun, whatever. I go, that's that's not a subject, though. I go, what's your real favorite subject? And he looked up at me and he says, well, I kind of like math. And I go, really? You know, I'm, I was kind of a little bit surprised. And I go, really? And he's like, yeah, I really kind of like it. It's It's really easy to me. And I go, awesome so we talked a little bit more and i asked him i said so what do you want to do when you grow up and he goes i don't really know he goes i like to draw too and i go um how well do you draw and he goes i draw pretty good i draw pretty good he goes i draw like i, I can draw houses and stuff and i go you ever thought about being an architect and he said, yeah, I actually did think about being an architect he's like and he mentioned i can't remember what he mentioned but he said the architect of something and um, it was it was kind of it was nice, but it was small. And I said to him, "Oh, he he mentioned being an architect of, of of houses." And I said, "Okay." I said, "That's cool." I said, "That's that's marvelous." I go, "But how about you? How about you think a little bit bigger?" And he goes, "What do you mean?" And I I stood. We were at a corner, four corners, and I stood with him on the corner, and I said, "Come with me." stand here and i grabbed him by the shoulder you know lightly and stood with him and i said turn around i said turn with me i said you see all this around us and he goes yeah and i go this is math and i go do you realize someone had to sit down and draw each one of these houses the way that they look on the street and i go you're talking about drawing a house what if you don't want to draw a house what if you want to design cities and he goes you can do that I go, absolutely. I said, they pay people millions of dollars to design cities. Millions of dollars to design cities. And I go, I know, I, and I started pointing to the road and stuff. I said, you know, the, the road is the road. But I said, below the road, there's all of these pipes and there's a sewer system that 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 helps out this, uh, the houses and the buildings. And I go, you can build, you can design buildings. You can, I mean, I went through it with them. And this young black man, he was a boy, I know, but young black man, I saw his eyes light up. He, you know, he had that flint in his eyes, of, of, you know, when I first saw him, but it was light. But his eyes lit up. And I said, this is all math. And I said, and you love math and you can draw. We need people like you to draw this for the next generation. And his eyes lit up. And he goes, I can really draw all of this. And I said, you can draw it. I said, don't take time, but you can do it. So why not do it? And he walked away. And I walked away. But that young man knew that his life was in his hands. And this is what we must do. One more story. I saw... Two young ladies just about to graduate from um, high school. 
I saw him. It was a hot day, hot day, just absolutely hot. It was like 90 something degrees. You could literally like see steam coming off the, it was crazy. Anyway, so I was walking down to catch the bus and there's the two ladies. And you know, you, you, you've seen, you've seen this before where you walk up on a couple of black folks and you can automatically tell which one has they stuff together and which one is kind of just floating. So I was talking to the both of them. And uh, they were both going to nursing, uh, to, to a nursing program to become a nurse. And talking to the one, I could tell that like her mind was, it was beyond where she even, I think, recognized it to be. So she was talking about how her mom became a nurse and she wanted to follow a nose in, in her mom's footsteps and blah, blah, blah. And I looked at her and I said, my dear, I have no doubt that you will be a good nurse. But let me ask you this. Why stop at being a nurse? Why not go to be a doctor? And I truthfully expected her to say, well, I don't have the grades for it. She didn't say that. You know what she said to me? And this is, I, I blame this on so many of our elders. Because, and I don't, that's the wrong word. I don't blame it on them. Because they have been manipulated and busted and, and and it's what has been done to them is horrible so I don't blame it on them but what I I can't even finish it but anyway what she said to me was I never even thought about that and I said to her go on trust me when I tell you I don't tell this to everybody you don't know how smart you are, but I can see it in you. I can see it in you. You need to go and become a doctor. And she, her eyes didn't light up like the kid. But, you know, you, you, you know how people get that look on their face where the, you can tell the wheels are turning. That's what happened with her. And I realized, there we go. We got to. Sometimes we have to do this for ourselves. I've had to do it. When I first started recording these things and posting them, man, ooh, I didn't even think I could do it, but I did it. We need to start looking to the future and realize that the future is now. And if we are not going to build stability in our communities, kiss them goodbye. We're basically signing our death warrant. Because, or should I even say our death certificate prior to us even dying? Because the country is likely to get more unstable. All right, you guys. Um, questions, comments, concerns, let me know. Peace to you all.